So what I'm going to cover tonight really is about how to use your energy use and manage it at a household level. So as Susan said, my name is Ruth Buggy. I'm the program manager of the Sustainable Energy Communities and Schools program here in SAI. I've worked in SAI for just over 17 years across a whole range of programs and departments, and my background is in engineering. So in terms of the outcomes today, this is what we hope you'll be able to do from this talk, um, which is really understand how you use energy in your household and identify some quick wins for your energy use. Um, introduce the Stay Well and Warm campaign and the different supports that have been introduced by government this year. Then be able to identify some medium term options to make your home more energy efficient. And then look at how you as a household could plan a low carbon journey at your own pace into the future. So it's really low cost, no cost, low cost, medium cost and higher cost options available to you, but how to consider them and which ones might work for you as a household. So we hope tonight's event will take about 20, 25 minutes. Susan is welcoming questions in the chat box and then at the end, any questions that are left, we can certainly talk through. As always, and as Susan has mentioned, this will be up on our YouTube site and the slides are freely available, so there's no need to try and take notes or anything like that during it. Um, and we do welcome your feedback. If we've missed achieving these outcomes, please let us know. If there are topics you feel we haven't covered and you think we could and they'd be of interest, again, feel free to send us feedback through SEC at SEAI.ie. We will be sending out a feedback survey in time, so anything there is welcome as well. So understanding how you use energy in your household and we're all different and we all have different profiles. And yes, when you put it all together, the, the national picture every day looks broadly the same. So we all think we're making individual choices, but collectively we take the same amount of electricity from the grid almost every day. Um, so really why this topic was important and why we chose it. A lot of questions we get when we go out to meet communities is questions like, what can I do? Where do I start? And what will work in my home? So that's really what we're trying to do here is address those kind of questions for people um, and see can we support you in identifying the solutions for yourself. So we're going to show you how to identify your energy use and make comparisons between different energy users and um, options in your home. What actions will make the biggest impact and then tailoring the solutions to you and your home. So we recognise that energy and climate action are complex subjects and it can be confusing with all the information out there to decide what is right for you. For many people, the option of doing a lot of retrofit works is not an option right now. So we're here to show you what else can be done that could help out, um, particularly this winter. So what we're recommending in terms of where to start, there is a tracker on our website. So it's called the Home Energy Commitment um, Editable Version. We're, we're good for the snappy names here in SEI, but that link there is a live link and you can find it if you go to the community section of our website. It's called the Home Energy Commitment Form. And what it allows you to do is actually fill out a tracker of your energy use. So when you go to this page, you can actually go in and fill out this. You can download it and you can fill out the amount of money you spend and what your meter reading is, and you can keep this as your tracker. So this is really about trying to see how much energy you use in your home. And it's best to try and capture both litres of oil, if that's what you use, or kilowatts of electricity or gas, as well as how much it costs, because you can get a better assessment of what your actual usage is in the units whereas the cost can change so much from one month to another that it can be difficult to determine. Is that a usage or is that just a price change that has made that number look so different? So in electricity, it's about filling in your electricity bills. Most people get a bill every second month. And um, so if you're if you've got an online account, you could go back for the last couple of months and fill out what your bills were to see how much they cost. On heating, you might have gas, you might have oil. Um, you might buy tanks of gas either and you might have different options. You may also be buying coal or turf or combination of that. The important thing is to try and like everything be as honest and accurate as you can because the idea of this is just to try and inform where the best options are for your home. And then transport. So this can be petrol or diesel or could be public transport to see what you're spending and where your different options are. There is a notes section there as well. So if there's some particular changes in a, in a month, for example, if your boiler broke down and um, you mightn't have much usage that month, so that could be a reason why it might look lower. Or if you were on holidays for six weeks, if you're lucky enough, um, there might be much electricity usage. So it's good to try and see, was that an odd month and might it skew your figures overall? Um, so it's just there so that you can make the best assessment of the information that you have here. So when you look at that and how to use it, if you've already, as I said, if you've got a copy of your bills, you could fill it out for now. 
Um, it is important to check if your bill is based on actual energy or estimated units. So there's a sample electricity bill there and what really it shows is your meter reading might have a little letter next to it, which is either an A, an E or a C typically. An A stands for the actual energy use, which means your meter was read. E stands for an estimate. So the energy supplier has looked at your usage profile and reckons that's how much you would spend in that period of time. And then C is that the, the figure was given by the customer. So the more meter readings you give around the time billing, the more accurate your bill would be, or you may have a smart meter or a digital meter that can actually send that data automatically. If you don't have 12 months of data, it's a really good idea to start capturing the information from now on. Um, it's also a good idea to get into the habit of regularly reading your meter. So we have a, win the first of our winter workshop was about home energy bill basics and how to read your meter. So the link is there to go back in if you have any difficulty identifying this information. So on the assumption that you've now gathered enough data and you've completed your tracker, there's a few questions to ask yourself. Were you surprised by the result? Is it what you expected? Do you think this represents a typical year in your home or should you adjust it for changes? For example, you might have had more people or less people staying, children off to college or things like that. Or have you suddenly moved changing from home, working from home or gone away from working from home and that's no longer a factor? So they're the kind of things that if, they're, if it's an unusual year, it could be a little bit dangerous to base big decisions on it. But if it's something you do on an ongoing basis and you keep the tracker up, you'll get a much more accurate picture of your own energy use. Um, personally, when I did this, um, I was shocked that my transport costs were four times my heating costs. Um, and I was focusing, I'd done a retrofit in my home, a modest retrofit in my home, and I thought I could do more and I could spend a lot more money there. But actually, with the 400% cost going on transport, that was actually where I needed to focus from a carbon emissions perspective and a cost spend return. Um, so even though I'm an engineer and even though I've worked in SAI, I was very surprised by my results. So it's certainly a way of focusing where limited investment can make the most impact. So when you've done your tracker and you've got three figures for your electricity, your, your heating and your transport, look at the biggest number first. If this happens to be electricity, there are a number of quick wins to reduce your electricity use. Questions to see are, could you use the tumble dryer less? Do you have access to an outside area to dry your clothes? Most of us that have radiators use radiators to dry our clothes. I am very guilty of it, but I'm also conscious that we need to make sure we've good ventilation when we do that. So it's a bit of a balancing act. The, the moisture that you evaporate from your clothes, drying it on the radiator or on a stand or a, a clothes horse in the house does mean that moisture goes into your home. Um, and if you don't make sure there's good ventilation, that can lead to mold issues in the house. Can reduce the temperature in your washing machine and dishwasher. Most have an eco setting, typically around 30 degrees on a washing machine. Um, most of the electricity used by your washing machine actually goes into the heating of the water to wash the clothes. So it's really important to ensure that you're only using the temperature that you need to use to clean our clothes. Most of us clean clothes that possibly don't necessarily need to be cleaned at the rate we clean them. Um, so it's getting into that habit of checking, do they need to be washed? And if they do, can they be washed at a lower temperature? Is your hot water heated by the immersion? If it is, do you have a timer and a thermostat on it? These are fairly small changes that can be added. Now, you do need to bring in possibly a plumber or an electrician if you're going to start putting in thermostats and timers, but it's certainly something to look at. If you use an electric, if you use an electric shower, is it possible to shorten the time that it's in use? And have you switched your LED bulbs, uh, your bulbs to LEDs? And we did a workshop last time on the different choices of energy saving bulbs and how to select the right one for you. So this is a really good chart. There's variations of it around, but it was done by uh, Dr. Eva Foley in the University of Belfast. And what's good about it, it appeared in the examiner, but across the bottom um, of the graph is actually the amount of time different pieces of equipment are used. So whilst a hairdryer doesn't use a lot of electricity because it's only used for a short amount of time. If you had that on for a long time, it will be quite an intensive energy user. Um, so you can see the things that we use very intermittently, like the kettle and the hairdryer and the toaster, don't use very much at all. But things like the heating and the laptop go on for a lot longer. But in terms of the energy use, the big users here are our heating systems, as you would expect. Um, the electric cooker, tumble dryer, electric shower and a plug-in heater. 
So it's just knowing the comparative difference. I mean, I'd be quite happy to give up vacuuming if that saved energy, but I <laughs> probably shouldn't. So it's just about working out which things you want to, what you can reduce um, without sacrificing too much of your standard of living, um, or in my case, the, the standard in my home. But it is about seeing, OK, if I have the heating on for five hours to heat the house, would I be better off if I'm only in one room using a plug-in heater for 10 minutes twice or three times a day? And that can be a much more efficient way if you're only using part of the house. It's also really important to see where your home is warmest. If you are spending long periods of the day, is there a sunny, you know, if there's a south facing aspect to your home, is that is there a room there that you could work from when you're spending a long time at home? So I just think it's a it's a good way of comparing the different energy use and how much time they're typically in use for. So the big ones, the immersion heater, the tumble dryer and the electric shower um, electric cooker. So options there around using air fryers. Microwaves are definitely the most efficient, um, but you typically might not be able to do everything that you want to do in that. So on the assumption that I've completed my tracker and then heating is your highest cost. Government is recommending that we reduce the heating temperature 19 degrees. A lot of people think 21 is the standard and it has been for quite a long time. And um, it's important to cite your thermostat in the right room so that it's reading the temperature for the areas that you're living in and that it isn't affected by a room that has an open fire or another direct heat source. And um, you don't need 19 degrees in hallways or circulation areas. If you're working in the kitchen, Typically, if you're moving around and doing jobs, you don't need 19 degrees there either. And a lot of people have a preference for cooler temperatures in bedrooms. So it's about checking what temperature you have. If you have thermostatic radiator valves in rooms that are unused, it's possible to turn down those rooms and managing that way. Then having a look to see if you have heating controls that are easy to understand and operate um, and look at ones that can be. And there's a lot of really good ones out there and you can control them from your phone. Um, I know it means that you can turn it on when you're not at home, but it also means you can turn it off if you forgot accidentally not to do it before you left. There is a 700 euro grant for heating controls for homes built before 2011. If your home has a separate circuit for the hot water and the heating system so that you could control them separately currently, that grant will go a very long way towards doing it. If you have to put in new pipework to separate them, it can be a bit more of an expensive job. Then consider other unnecessary drafts in your home. Um, do you have an open chimney but rarely use the fire? Could you consider a chimney balloon, a chimney sheep or a damper in your chimney to stop that happening? Literally a chimney is a four inch hole in your, a four inch diameter hole in your roof. Um, so when you turn the heating on and that fire is there, the hot air is rising and it's going up the chimney and being drawn out of your house. Um, and because of the differences in air pressure, it's pulling in air from outside to replace that air that's been removed. So you certainly wouldn't sit in a room with a four inch hole in the wall, but we do it with open chimneys all the time. So it's important to ensure you have the right amount of ventilation in your home. But if there's unnecessary drafts, it's worth considering ways of improving the comfort and reducing that being lost in your home. Things like carpets on floors, particularly over suspended wooden floors downstairs, are really effective at reducing drafts. Closing curtains when it gets dark in the evening and getting good curtains or blinds that are thermally insulated can make a big difference as well, particularly if you've got older windows. Things that we used to do that we don't do anymore are the kind of actions that can really help. Um, do you heat the whole house but really only need to use one or two rooms? And that's back to that idea of would a small portable heater suit your needs better? Um, or are you using the heating when you need it? So they're the options kind of around heating. So then if transport is your highest cost, as it was in my case, are all journeys necessary? Uh, do you have other options? Do you have access to public transport? Is working from home an option and less costly than your commuting cost? And certainly a lot of people are weighing up now whether going to work and getting free heating in the office is cheaper than the commute that you would have. So it's a case of working that out. Is there an option to carpool once a week for school or work? Um, do you have a plan to replace your car in the next few years? If so, what are you considering? Um, can you do a comparison life cycle assessment between different transport options? We do have a comparison calculator between electric cars and non-electric models, so you can see what you currently have and then compare it to an option of an electric vehicle. And it is hoped over the coming years there'll be a much bigger range of second-hand electric cars in the market. Though, I believe they've done research into EV owners and they appear to be holding on to their cars a lot longer than people in non EV 
uh, owners. So that could be some of the explanation why there's so few back in the market. Um, so then we can look at what action to take. So this is kind of on the, the second page of that tracker page. Um, so having a look at all of those things, are there five target actions that you could take as a household? Um, so there's an example of some easy tips to make there. And then now you know how energy is used as a household. Do you see any options in the lists above to help identify what could work for you? So that idea of could we turn down the washing machine temperature to 30 degrees? And that doesn't mean it can't ever go up if you have a particular washing need. But in general, most things could be washed well at that temperature. Turn down the heating to 19 degrees. Could reduce your showers to five or 10 minutes. I put in hair washing because that makes a difference for me between how long the shower takes. Um, we will check that all our light bulbs have LED replacements or if they don't, that we have them ready for when the, the, the bulb is gone. And we'll carpool once a fortnight to swim practice. So even just that, looking at how we can change the options. So the government have launched a Stay Warm and Well campaign this winter to support people in the face of rising prices. And there's a number of initiatives that were brought in. So households will receive the 600 euro electricity credit. So most of us have had two and um, they've been paid in three installments in the billing cycle. Um, and this is received automatically. They've also reduced the VAT on energy bills and they've also reduced the public sector obligation levy as well. Um, and then they've increased the grants available from SAI. So there's, there's quite a bit there, particularly around the electricity bills. For those in receipt of social welfare payments um, from January 2023, the threshold for the fuel allowance has increased um, quite significantly. Um, and from 2023, um, the weekly allowance um, has increased as well above the state pension. Um, there's also the tax relief will stay in place. Um, and then there are a number of supports in terms of advice. So the Commission for the Regulation of Utilities has a customer care team for people who questions about their electricity or gas suppliers. SEI has a whole range of grants available um, and advice on energy efficiency on our website. Alone with the department have set up a support line for older people who may need support with their energy bills this winter. And MABs can do an awful lot of help in terms of managing debt, including energy bills, and they can provide advice there. They're also really good in that they can negotiate with your energy supplier if you do get into debt. Um, and with the CRU and MABs working together, they've brought in a whole range of changes, particularly for people who face a risk of disconnection. So when we look at the options beyond what we've seen in the tracker and what our medium term options are, we need to look at how energy is lost in the home. So this is the assumption that you might be in a position to do some measures. So roof and walls are where most of the heat is lost in a house. Um, doors and windows, not so much, and floors uh, are there at 20%. So we have a whole range of grants in SEI, and there's kind of three main categories. There's the free energy grade op option, which is typically for people in receipt of certain social welfare payments. It's typically called the Warmer Home Scheme. It's fully funded by SEI. There's no outlay by the household at all. We pay the contractor directly for the work done. Um, there's a home survey, we select the contractor, they do the works and we provide for a building energy rating to be done. There is a waiting list of about two years um, for this service, but we're working to try and increase the capacity on the scheme. The one stop shop service, which was launched earlier this year, is the complete home upgrade solution. It's part funded up to about 50% by SAI. And the idea is, is the one stop shop fully manages the solution and does the grant application and looks after all the paperwork for you. You're bringing together a number of measures at the same time. You only have to pay for the works less the grant. It's already discounted from it, so you don't have to get financing for that. And you have to achieve a minimum of a building energy rating of a B2, which is quite a high standard and a high a good efficiency in your home. Um, but when the work is done and then there's the individual grant upgrades, which was formerly known as the, the Better Energy Home Scheme and has been around since 2009. It's a selection of individual grants for home energy upgrades. You can, of course, combine multiple grants together, uh, but you apply for whatever you want as distinct measures. It's part funded by SCI and it was part funded to about 30 percent, but that has uh, for a number of measures actually increased to nearly 80 percent, particularly for attic and cavity wall insulation. You typically manage your home energy upgrade. You select your contractor from our register. You do the grant application, which is very straightforward online and you typically get your letter of offer within a couple of minutes. The contractor does the work, uh, you pay for the work and then claim the grant back. So you do have to have the financing in place to cover the full cost. 
So in terms of quick wins on the grants, so earlier this year, around the same time as the one stop shop was launched, um, there were significant increases were made to two of the most cost effective grants. So this is attic insulation and cavity wall. So the grants are currently estimated to cover about 80% of the cost of the installation of these measures in an average home. Tricky homes, different things like that will change that, but on average, this is what it covers. You will need to get a building energy rating done afterwards, and there's a link there to the full range of grants. But you can see an apartment for attic insulation will get 800 euro, while a detached house will get 1500 euro. That grant used to be 300 euro, regardless of the house type. Excuse me while I take some tea. Um, so you can see there's a very significant increase in the amount of grant that's available there. Cavity wall increased from 400 euro uh, for all house types to 700 for an apartment and 1700 for a detached house. Just to say it can be difficult to consider cavity wall in an apartment standalone, but if there was multiple apartments in the same block all working together, that would be a very feasible option to do. And um, so, so there it's a very, very significant increase. So if you don't have sufficient attic insulation or you can install cavity wall insulation. They're really good quick win measures and they have a huge impact on your energy use because you're getting the 30% through the wall and the 30% through the attic being addressed. So you're significantly reducing the amount of energy lost in your home. And um, again, your home does need to be built before 2011 to be eligible for this because at that time the building standard required you to have the right level of insulation. So your home shouldn't need it. So you've done the quick wins, you've looked at the measures that are even better for your home and then looking at planning a low carbon uh, journey for your home. So really this is about trying to take the longer term actions or at least plan for the longer term actions in your home. So getting a building energy rating done is a really good place to start. Um, the building energy rating now comes with a building advisory report, which is shown on the right hand side. So it actually shows you what the heat loss is from the different elements in your home and then what the options are, the potential to up grade those options um, and you can pre prepare your home now and then what the potential is and what the benefits of upgrading your home and what the CO the tons of carbon dioxide would be in terms of that as well. So you can see in the example here the home is starting on an F and it has the potential of becoming a B2 by doing roof insulation, wall insulation and windows um, and the opportunity to change the heating system and renewables is really good. Um, in terms of potential. So it's a really good place to start. But if you live in a house that has very similar houses nearby and you know your neighbours have done one, it's going to be the same for yours. So it's kind of a, a chance to have a conversation and see where to start. Um, you may also have gotten a detailed home survey when you purchased your home and that could have some really good advice of what your options are. So if you have a building energy rating done, there are a number of bare data services that can use that information to help identify the correct measures for your home. So here is an example. So in this case, whilst I do have a building energy rating for my home, when I went to draw this out, um, my building energy rating expired last year. So I just used the, there's an option to select um, a standard typical house of my type. So you go in and you select what year it was built and then whether it's a, it's a detached or a semi-detached or a terraced home and it will identify what's typical for your home type. Um, now it says the current is an E1, which isn't true for my home, but that's just setting out an average. If I hadn't done the work I did 10 years ago, then that's probably where I would have been. And it's shown what the types of options are there for the, the various measures. So you can see it's suggesting roof and wall uh, and windows and doors and heating controls, but it's shown that I could very easily get to a B3 home and that there's a number of grants there that would cover a lot. So that's on the Bear Wow website, which is supported by SSE and their one stop shop on post have a similar service. And really both of these programs just pull information from the National Building Energy Rating Database to do these assessments. You will need what's called your MPRN, your meter point reference number, and that's easily available from your electricity bill. Um, and they also ask for a recent utility bill just to prove that you're that person so they can give you the data for your home. So now you know how much energy your home uses and you've taken the no and low cost actions to reduce your energy use. You've looked at the medium cost options and now you want to move towards a, a high energy rate at home. So using the resources here, you can plan out which measures make the biggest impact on your home. So this next section is really about things of what to consider. So do you know how old your current boiler is? Do you know how efficient it is? If you don't, you can look up the heating appliance register of performance 
It's a HARP database and it'll actually tell you what the efficiency of your boiler is. If your boiler was installed in the last 10 years, the chances are it's about 90% or better. If it's 15 or 20 years old, it might be in the low 60s um, in terms of efficiency. So you could make a big improvement by changing your boiler. However, what if you want to consider changing to a heat pump? Um, do you know what it would take your home to be ready for a heat pump? So really a heat pump goes into a home that is well insulated and doesn't have any unnecessary drafts in it. Um, because it's using heat at a lower temperature, the impact of drafts would feel a lot more and it's also running for a lot longer. So you want to make sure that the building can hold on to that heat. So you need to look at infiltration and insulation. Um, if you know how old your current boiler is, a gas boiler, you're kind of lucky in the 10 to 15 year category. Uh, oil boilers, 15 to 20 years is typically the lifespan. So if your boiler is getting into those kind of ranges, it's time to start considering what the replacement will be. Um, an example I often use is if your boiler breaks down on Christmas Eve, you're going to take whatever the plumber has in the van because you need heat. Um, so try and get ahead of that kind of emergency reaction and say, OK, this is what our next option is going to be and we're ready for it. So then consider what are your other plans in terms of other upgrades in your home? So might you be considering a new kitchen or bathroom? And um, so what can you do very cost effectively at the same time, such as considering wall and floor insulation? Because I can promise you if you put in a new kitchen or bathroom, there's no way you're taking down a wall uh, in the next 10 years to replace that. So it could be really cost effective to insulate behind the kitchen cabinets and things like that. At the same time, you're talking hundreds of euros um, as opposed to the thousands it would cost to replace the kitchen or move it at a later date. So it's just thinking through what you're going to do and what's the energy opportunity at that point in time. Same for considering a new driveway or paving or gardening. Would you consider an external cable for a future EV charger if that's an option? Um, if you're upgrading your roof, your roof tiles are changing something there. Could you consider solar panels or at least making sure that the, the roof is suitable for future solar panels and that it's, it's considered as part of that change? We make lots and lots of energy decisions every day that aren't identified as energy decisions. So it's just thinking about them in the context of energy and does this decision your choices into a good choice for the future. Um, so there's lots and lots of resources out there. Pull some together here. There's the Keeping Well and Warm booklet, which is some really good advice, particularly for older people in terms of ensuring that they stay warm this winter. So if there's people in your life that might need that booklet, it's available online. It's also available from our offices as well. There's a link there to MABS and all the supports that they have. We have a YouTube channel that has lots and lots and lots of videos about lots of different topics that if you want to dig in and have a look around it's there. We have the reduce your use guide and information that was launched by government earlier on this year. There's a link to the home energy grants and then ESB network put out uh, is this a good time pilot so you can sign up for free and really just consists of them sending text messages about different challenges and changes in your energy use and different things you can do to make a difference um, and it's interesting. OK, I'm a bit of a nerd, but it's interesting to me to see what comes in. So if that's of your interest area, there's an option there just to sign up and see what's going on. Um, and that's really all. So if you want to, to get some more support, SEI has a reduce your use home energy plan guide as well, and you can sign up there. And again, it's information, it's videos, it's tips helping you out. Um, just to say there's lots of information out there and this is just part of that kind of conversation.